when I was a kid, to me, Batman was this big man in black tights who beat up the bad guys. He was, first and foremost, the most famous superhero next to Superman. Of course, that's still all true, but I didn't start to think of Batman and his stories as having political implications until I first watched The Dark Knight as a teenager. Here, the Joker invokes the notion of a better class of criminal, burns money to make his symbolic point, and bludgeons Batboy with some variation of the trolley case over and over and over again. But films and comics aren't the only mediums Batman writers have slipped into to talk about politics and philosophy. If Teen Titans and Steven Universe and Avatar The Last Airbender have proven anything in the years since, it's that animated shows for kids can tell meaningful stories and be about something more than foiling the villain of the week and telling kids to do their chores and listen to their parents. And Batman the Animated Series is something of a poster child when it comes to American kids' cartoons that adults still enjoy and respect. And what really struck me going through it for the first time is this major recurring theme. This theme of the relationship between social and economic classes and crime. Many of the show's characters can fit into a few implied social categories. At the very top, corporate elites like company CEOs and presidents Ferris Boyle and Daniel Mockridge, social elites like Pierce Chapman and Veronica Vreeland, and billionaires like Bruce Wayne have enough expendable resources on reserve that $1 million from a trust fund is petty cash. These corporate elite generally operate within the law, but they have sufficient means to often get away with blurring those lines. Roland Daggett walks that line as both a corporate elite as well as an example of the criminal elite, which is more obviously embodied by mafia bosses and crime lords like Rupert Thorne or Tony Zuko. Oswald Cobblepot, more infamously known as the Penguin, is a criminal elite who aspires to be among the corporate and social elite. But between these two similar and powerful worlds, there's this invisible barrier that he can't seem to cross because he can't pass as someone proper. These corporate and social elites hold incredible power over the middle class. White collar workers like Dr. Leslie Tompkins or the news reporter Summer Gleason can live comfortably most of the time, but brilliant inventors and scientists such as Edward Nigma, Jervis Tetch, and Victor Fries are all at the whims of their greedy financers, who care far more for profit than for progress. And it's harder yet for blue collar workers like Earl Cooper or Charlie Collins, who struggled to carve out a normal, stable life in Gotham City, where unpredictable supervillains occupy yet another position of power alongside the more established corporations and crime organizations. And at the bottom are the marginalized and impoverished, the homeless, the orphaned children, and people who have been cast aside because of disabilities or abnormal appearances. While not everyone easily fits into one of these categories, what struck me about Batman the Animated Series is that for a 90s kids cartoon, the writers had an awful lot to say about the weights and pulls of poverty and desperation against these rigged systems designed by elites for the benefit of elites. Now, the writers don't go all the way and start calling for a people's revolution, but it is interesting how far they do go and what they actually do say. Even if the kids watching it in the 90s weren't picking up on it consciously, this very well may have been for thousands or hundreds of thousands of kids, the first time they'd ever really encountered and in any degree processed a serious critique of capitalism. Well, serious, relatively speaking. Also, when I say Batman the Animated Series, I am counting both the original series run from 1992 to 1995, as well as the episodes of the new Batman Adventures from 1997. But I'm not including Batman Beyond, if nothing else, because I have a feeling that I'll have a lot more to say about that on its own whenever I watch it. And I'm also not focusing on other Batman or DC shows or movies or comic books. And there's only one part in here where I get into something that the creators have said. Look, there's a lot of Batman out there, and for right now, this is plenty enough to talk about. 
Out of the animated series' 109 episodes, this video discusses 40. I don't think that most of the episodes of Batman the Animated Series are quote-unquote about capitalism, but there's at least some aspects of these 40 episodes that I think make them all relevant to the conversation. And lastly, I want to make it explicitly clear that I don't think Batman the Animated Series is only about economics. There are many other fascinating routes for theorizing and analyzing. As part of my research for this video, I took an extensive look at Dr. Travis Langley's Batman and Psychology. So, right up front, my focus here is on the economic aspects of crime and not as much on the potential pathological sources, such as how several members of Batman's rogues gallery might have conditions including psychopathy, sociopathy, antisocial personality disorder, dissocial personality disorder, or adult antisocial behavior. And if learning about these psychological interpretations of Batman interests you, I highly recommend this book. But I shan't continue with this preamble much longer, because as you know, time is money. And today, we're talking money. In the episode Robin's Reckoning, it's revealed that the reason Robin's parents were murdered is that the circus had not paid the mob for protection. This is a business transaction with a fatal coercive element. If you don't buy what they're selling, you pay the biggest price. In Batman the Animated Series, the language of organized crime and illegal commerce often assumes the same tone as that of more legitimate business. Whether the product is a drug or the service is a mafia's protection racket. In a bullet for Bullock, you've got dealers saying things like, Here you go, my friend, and a happy new year to you. Free enterprise, what makes America great? And there's crime bosses at the top warning, Careful with that merchandise, boys. You break it, you buy it, capiche? These criminal elite justify their actions as just business. And I'm sure to many of them, they've convinced themselves that it is that if any innocents are caught in the crossfire, it's nothing personal. At the same time, of course, it's much easier to hurt people who are vulnerable. One, because they're vulnerable, and two, because you're more likely to get away with it. After all, if you're hurting people at the bottom, who's really going to notice? The Forgotten presents an alarming, inciting mystery laced with social critique. I can't prove it, but I'm positive people are disappearing. Transients, regulars, Old faces I miss seeing. You've talked to the police? Of course, but the police had their hands full. And homeless people disappearing is not big news. If these were working people with families and kids that go to school and all the rest, maybe their disappearance would make the news. If for no other reason, then it might make people more afraid that it could happen to them too. But in this episode, when the homeless and the unemployed are kidnapped and forced to work in dangerous mines, it's unclear how long this might have continued to happen if they hadn't also accidentally kidnapped a now amnesiac Bruce Wayne. Their overlord is an embodiment of gluttony, who comfortably fans himself while barking orders and threatening to eat them alive if they don't cooperate. Boss Biggis is a cartoon caricature, but his callousness has real-world equivalents not just in slave drivers throughout history, but also company executives who know their business is exploiting cheap labor or implementing unsafe worker conditions, but it doesn't matter when the profits are coming out so, so green. And maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but I don't find it hard to extrapolate from the image of Boss Biggest some kind of commentary about the endless consumption as an aspect of capitalism. There's also this dream sequence in which Bruce Wayne, having forgotten who he is, stares at himself in the mirror, before seeing his own reflection turn into that of the Joker, who drags him all the way down from skyscraper heights down to the city level, wherein the dream turns to people asking Wayne for money. At first, he's happy to help out, but he quickly becomes overwhelmed by everyone's needs, to the point where he tears up that he can't do more, that he can't give enough to help everyone. This nightmare reflects how the episode first started, with an overview of the city, from the skyscrapers representing industry and power, to the street level, where people scrape to get by. This means that on some level, 
Bruce Wayne identifies within himself an aspect of his personality or his mind and psyche that's similar to the Joker. The sort of apathy that the Joker has would be my first guess as to what that similarity might be. That deep down there's a fear that he might be as cold and detached as the laughing madman himself. So even when he doesn't remember who he is, there exists this anxiety still within him. This anxiety about the gulf of inequality between his wealth and privilege and all of the people struggling to get by in the margins. At the end of the episode, Wayne remembers who he is and reveals his identity to his new friends. He offers them jobs before striding back off to live his lavish lifestyle. Bruce Wayne feels that he can help these people out by giving them a job, of course, in exchange for working for one of his companies. But for worse or better, he's convinced that he can do more good for these people as Batman than he ever could as Bruce Wayne outside throwing around some money for charity events or offering career opportunities. The Underdwellers is a similar episode in which orphaned children are threatened and manipulated into slave labor for another tyrant, the Sewer King. I took you in when nobody else would have you. It is I who care for you. I who provide for you. Would you rather I sent you back into the light? Back to those who hurt you and sent you away? Batman follows the trail down into the sewers, through the catacomb waterways beneath the city, and finds a hidden world of child slavery under the surface, where children are ordered into silence and obedience by an impatient authoritarian, one who appears as another unhinged caricature of the elite, this time a mad king that feels his decadence is the natural order of things. Batman's anger at the Sewer King might be greater than his anger at any other villain throughout the animated series. He resists the temptation to execute the Sewer King but he admits that he wants to, after seeing him deny these orphan kids their hope and their freedom. But even the Sewer King invokes the language of business, as though all of this is above board. Yes, I feed them, I clothe them, I discipline them, and I teach them a trade. When Park Row, an area of the city once regarded as a historical landmark, declines and develops the reputation of being a slum full of crime. Crooked businessman Roland Daggett proposes a development project that would kick everyone out of their homes and neighborhoods for the purpose of filling his and his investors' coffers. When the city zoning board rejects this request, Daggett resorts to a drastic alternative plan. He intends to blow the buildings up with explosives, no matter how many innocents may perish. Batman is able to intervene and save residents, but when Daggett addresses the situation on TV, this is his tone. It's tragic. Park Row may be an historical landmark, but it's also a breeding ground for crime. Of course, much as we disagree with the zoning board's decision, our hands are tied. Over the years, Park Row had become known as Crime Alley, and like with the homeless and the orphaned, the working class and impoverished people of this area became easy targets because of their invisibility and disposability. Not only were the people of Park Row not seen as important enough to matter, there's an opinion circulating that it would be a good thing if this nest of crime were to be burned away. It's a sad fact, but you have to expect violence in Crime Alley. These people don't value human life like we do. This block may be abandoned, but that building has people living in it. Hey, we told them to leave. They stand in the way of redevelopment, they get bulldozed. Nothing personal, just business. And although Daggett would never publicly endorse blowing up Crime Alley or wiping out an entire neighborhood full of people, note how this public industrialist does talk about them. As businessmen, the choice we face is clear. It's time we decide where we stand. Are we for progress or against it? For the future or for the past? For the weak or for the strong? Daggett draws this line down the middle and makes a dichotomy between two warring sides, progress, future, and the strength of industry against the side of decline, past, and weakness of the underclass. Both in Gotham City and in the real world, there's plenty of people who think this way, especially among the law-abiding elites 
and the people who think that perhaps one day they could be part of the elite. Not only are vulnerable populations at risk for the effects of violent crime, they are also at risk of turning to crime either to survive or to feel like they have some kind of agency in their lives. Left with the feeling that there's no other choice, one of the desperate residents of Park Row even takes a hostage. You took my job, Gotham City! You took my home! Somebody's gotta pay for that! I pick you. The episode Joker's Favor is all about how an average man accidentally falls under the thumb of the Joker and is powerless to do anything to escape. After a chance bad run-in with the Clown Prince of Crime, he is forced to make a deal that spares his life, but essentially gives the Joker one big IOU for his services at a future date. Two years later, the Joker makes good on his promise and interrupts this man's otherwise normal life, a life in a nice suburban neighborhood playing ball with his son. And the Joker coerces him to commit crimes by threatening not just him, but also his wife and kid. In Gotham City, if you're a regular middle-class worker, or worse yet, someone who is trying to find employment or not making enough money to make ends meet, ultimately you have no leverage going up against the rich and powerful. Whether it's the corporate elite, the criminal elite, or the supervillains, you'd best do what you're told or you're in jeopardy of losing everything. And if someone ends up turning to crime just in order to get by and falls into the hands of one of the rogues gallery or is hired as part of a criminal business, it's hardly any safer. In The Man Who Killed Batman, a misunderstanding causes people to think that some random weakling actually snuffed out the Dark Knight. He's celebrated for the accomplishment, but in the crime business, competitors are quite literally cutthroat and distrust is often the best policy. Our unwitting protagonist finds himself under the Gotham Sword of Damocles. Everyone wants to be at the top, but if you actually get there, you're never safe because everyone else wants your throne. And that's the catch. If you're desperate and at risk, you may wanna join up with these crime organizations for money and protection. But if you climb too high in the ranks, your life is now in a different kind of danger. And there's no escape from it, because even someone like Rupert Thorne, for all his money and all his power, is in constant danger at every turn. There's no peace and security, only the want of it. And perhaps no episode more clearly articulates the nature of crime in the series than the morality fable, It's Never Too Late. Here, the focus is on Robert Stromwell, head of the crime family that is rivals with Rupert Thorne. Both families are vying for control over the city, but the situation has taken a dangerous turn now that Stromwell's son has disappeared, and he presumes that Thorne has kidnapped him. But we find out, as does Robert Stromwell, that his son had never been kidnapped, or even so much as threatened by one of Thorne's men. No, his son had actually been in recovery from abusing his father's drugs, sold to him by his father's own people. We find out that's why Stromwell's wife had left him, to get away from what he was doing. But now it's even threatened the life of their child, who has become the exact type of person his products were meant to hook and exploit. We learn through flashbacks that Robert Stromwell once was a good kid who started to steal for fun. But when his brother risked his life to save him and ended up losing his leg, Robert Stromwell internalized this as guilt and concluded that he was no good. Stromwell continued down a life of crime that led him to the top, but not to happiness. As Batman words it, all his power and money bought him an empire of misery. Now, Robert Stromwell talks about how this is his city, like he owns the place, and he defends his actions by rationalizing that, hey, no one twists anyone's arms to take drugs. But his brother, now a priest, is able to cut through those arguments and extend to him forgiveness. And it's an offer that Stromwell accepts tearfully. If everything is a business transaction, then this is Stromwell cutting the best deal of his life to trade his criminal empire for the sake of gaining back his family and to buy back his soul in exchange for abandoning the love of money.
As a first time viewer, I was really impressed by the early two-parter Feet of Clay. Not just because of the stellar animation, but also because of the compelling tragedy at the center of the story. Matt Hagen was an accomplished actor whose career was suddenly put at risk following a terrible car accident. This is when Roland Daggett strolled in with his miracle product, Renew You, which he promised would accomplish in minutes what plastic surgery would take years to accomplish. Hagen, of course, took the chance to get his career and his life back. But this was a devil's bargain that got him hooked on the addictive properties of Renew You. And Daggett would weaponize this addiction and use it as leverage to make Hagen do his bidding. When Daggett is in danger of being indicted for insider trading, he employs Matt Hagen to use Renew You to disguise his face into Bruce Wayne's. But the addiction is getting worse. He needs more and more of the stuff just to stay stable, both physically as his body is breaking down, but also emotionally as he lashes out against his partner. When Hagen is attacked and becomes overexposed to Renew You, his body undergoes a terrible change. While he can use his new transforming powers to temporarily resume human shape, he is adamant that he can't come back from this, that the old Matt Hagen is history, this time for good, that from now on, there's only Clayface. Meanwhile, the so-called pharmaceutical king Roland Daggett only cares about marketing and distributing Renew You. He starts going on TV to promote his product, but on one show, he gets more than he bargained for. I hear he's selling Renew You through direct marketing because stores won't carry it due to its harmful side effects. What about the addictive properties of Renew You, Mr. Daggett? How once you're hooked on it, you can't stop using it without horrible pain. Why don't you show them what an overdose can do, Daggett? Why don't you tell, tell them about me? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the most famous example of corporate callousness in the series is the acclaimed episode Heart of Ice. Ferris Boyle is introduced as the head of Goth Corp, which has suddenly been under attack by the mysterious Mr. Freeze. Boyle is the frontrunner to win this year's Humanitarian Industrialist of the Year award, and he openly refers to Goth Corp as the People's Company. But when Bruce Wayne privately meets with Boyle, we see this corporate elite's other, more honest side. Look, Bruce, that people company line is great PR, but when the wage slaves start acting like they own the place, it's time to pull the plug. Know what I mean? After Boyle wins the Humanitarian Industrialist of the Year award and gives his big ol' speech, Mr. Freeze responds aloud. Humanity. Compassion. Charity. Where were those pretty words when she needed to hear them? That she that Mr. Freeze is referring to is his late wife, Nora Freeze. Bruce Wayne discovers the terrible secret that Ferris Boyle had been trying to cover up. Dr. Victor Freeze had been one of the scientists employed by Goth Corp. But when he started to use their funds on an unauthorized experiment, Boyle and his men showed up to shut him down by any means necessary. Even if the project was something as ambitious as a cryogenic freezing chamber that could save people stricken with inoperable, life-threatening ailments. Boyle didn't care that his research could save lives, or that stopping this research abruptly could terminate Nora in the process. Boyle only cared that Freeze's project had put him in some debt. Stop! This is my experiment. Your unauthorized experiment. I ordered funding suspended weeks ago. I'm already three million in debt thanks to you. It's our only chance. This is my equipment. Mine. I have every legal right to use it or not use it as I see fit. I say this project ends now. And in the ensuing confrontation, Boyle kicks Victor Freeze into chemicals, which sets in motion his transformation into the villain Mr. Freeze. While Freeze's story is tragic, and his motivations are understandable and sympathetic, Freeze's quest for revenge has left him arguably as ruthless and cold as Boyle. Now that he no longer feels the warmth of the sun or the warmth of someone's hand to hold, he says those are feelings he would kill for. And when one of his own men is in danger of freezing to death, if he's left behind, he callously walks off 
and justifies it as the man getting what he deserves for being too careless. Yes, Daggett and Boyle are pretty extreme cases, but in Batman the Animated Series, your average CEO or corporate exec or president of the company or boss is going to be opportunistic and exploitative by nature. Time and time again, there's this idea that they won't hesitate to take advantage of their employees or their customers or their competition so long as at the end of the day, it lines their pocket. Mr. Mockridge of the company Competitron abruptly tells Edward Nigma that he's fired, despite the fact that Nigma had created the game the company is now most known for, the Riddle of the Minotaur. It's literally in front of their building. Now, Nigma is baffled and asks if Mockridge has lost his mind. Surely he can't afford to fire their best developer. But Mockridge replies that, sure, he can afford to fire him especially since Nigma has been planning to sue him for unpaid royalties. I created the riddle of the Minotaur game. This company is making millions from my genius. Competitron software's success didn't come from the product, Nigma. Competitron is the corporate attitude. Its strength is in the boardroom, the deal. Your amoral greed is no match for an intellect like mine. Oh yeah? Then tell me something, Eddie. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? And this might be the most subtly barbed line against capitalism, or at the very least corrupt capitalism, in the whole series. Because the question of why Edward Nigma isn't rich gets to the core nature of wealth in this society. See, this isn't depicted as a world where the best rise to the top. In fact, innovators in general are taken advantage of. Rather, this is a world where the real money is to be found in controlling the innovators, in managing resources. When you break it down, Edward Nigma is smarter and likely more capable than Mockridge. But Mockridge is rich because that's not really what matters. You're rich because you were in the right place at the right time. And when the opportunity struck, you're willing to screw other people over. The message of the show is that wealth is not about intellect or hard work. It's about greed. And money makers like Mockridge are precisely the types of people that Bruce Wayne and the mayor want to bring to Gotham. They're quickly sold on the prospect of striking a deal with Mockridge because moving Competitron to Gotham could bring in $5.5 million per year in new jobs. Jobs that Wayne says the city desperately needs. Edward Nigma becomes the Riddler and targets Mockridge for revenge. Not only does Mockridge escape, but as Robin laments, before he goes, he pockets a cool 10 mil from the buyout. However, the episode ends with a potential note of karmic justice, because the Riddler is still out there, and now Mockridge lives in fear, leaving the Cape Crusader to ponder how much a good night's sleep is really worth. When you boil it down, this is a story about a brilliant inventor who was taken advantage of by a shrewd millionaire. The narrative comes across quite clearly that Edward Nigma was genuinely owed royalties, that he would have been correct, but had this actually gone to court, Mockridge had more resources to bring in. There's a chance that Nigma would have lost the lawsuit just by virtue of not having as many resources and as much money to pull in as Mockridge. Mockridge isn't really much of a cartoon villain. In real life, given these exact situations, I wonder how much he'd really have to fear. Throughout the series, greed motivates businesses and their owners to use people and discard them when they're no longer profitable. Charles Baxter, the president of the multi-million dollar Wacko Toys Company, licenses the Riddler's image for a lineup of new toys, because when he looks at the Riddler, he sees someone who will make him millions. Sure, the Riddler is dangerous and has quite the reputation, but more importantly, he's so famous that everybody's heard of him. And as Baxter brags, you can't buy that kind of market recognition. Now, if you want an example of how businesses discard people once they're no longer profitable, look no further than the sad case of Paige Monroe, who used to be a spokesmodel for major companies like Gotham Motors until she turned 30. Then the companies unceremoniously dropped her in favor of youth-oriented campaigns. While sleazy agents and producers brag about their power, the bitter truth is that no matter how hard Monroe worked, 
she wasn't wanted as a model anymore. And the networks didn't want her as a lead in their TV shows because younger actors would draw in more ratings. It's even worse for Mary Dahl, whose case of systemic hypoplasia gives her the appearance of a small child, even when she's actually an adult. Dahl played the lead role as a child character when she was in fact 20 years old. And 10 years later, at the age of 30, this has deeply affected her psyche. It's not only her physical growth that's been stunted. Her time in the limelight and the nature of her celebrity image has also stunted her emotionally. Mary Dahl studied and trained and auditioned for other roles, but no one wanted her to play roles for adults. It's no wonder, then, how desperately she clings to her former success. She's trying to reclaim that one part of her life that brought her positive attention and success, even if really the whole time she was being exploited for ratings. People didn't care about Mary Dahl. Her coworkers resented her. The entertainment industry didn't give her big chances. And even her fans turned their backs on her when she wasn't giving them that cutesy image that they wanted. And it's not just individual people who are exploited. The episode The Worry Men shows how out of touch social elites will go to other countries, live temporarily outside their comfort zone, then come back to complain how hard it was for them and crack jokes about bugs the size of their trust funds, only to turn and wax poetic about the importance of preserving those precious resources. Because, of course, to this group of people, what matters most are resources. Resources that can be drawn from, used up, and profited off of. Cameron Kaiser spends nearly $300 million on his new lavish casino. And when this bankrupts him, rather than accepting financial responsibility for his outlandish spending, Kaiser purposefully themes the casino after the Joker to make the Joker want to show up and blow up his casino. He didn't care that it would endanger his guests or even his employees. Kaiser just wanted to collect the insurance money. And then there's the so-called terrible trio of three well-off social elites who cross the lines into crime. Awfully chummy with the help, Bruce. Do you thank the garbage man for picking up your trash? You know how he feels about the servants. It's important to help others. It may sound corny, but hey, it's how I feel. You must recognize that you are a superior animal, Bruce. A member of the elite. Pull! They're young, and they're bored, and they have so much money to spend, but nothing left to spend it on. They feel like they're already on top of the world. And as they lament, what do the Rajas do when there's no more tigers left to hunt? The answer appears to be invent new prey and chase an even bigger thrill. These idle rich masquerade in the night as thieves, not because they want the money that they're stealing, but because for them, this most dangerous game is entertainment. They dismiss the harm that they've done to others and assure themselves that, of course, they'll just pay everyone back. It'll be fine. Now, their love of money looks a bit different. They don't desperately try to wring out every last cent out of the people they exploit. In fact, they don't mind throwing money into the streets as a distraction tactic or bribing security guards so they don't get caught. They act as though none of this even matters because they've reached a point of privilege where they think they're invulnerable and little sums of money are no longer a loss. The attitude of the terrible trio is completely at odds with what Bruce Wayne believes. In the episode Cold Comfort, he shares what his father once told him, that those who have the most must give the most. Bruce Wayne is an ultra wealthy philanthropist, which may or may not be as rife with contradiction as being a hero who saves the day by intimidating his prey with fear. He's someone who won't take a life, so the worst criminals like the Joker endure. And in order to keep giving so much money to charity, Bruce Wayne also has to ensure that his company keeps making money to fuel his corporate empire. In the end, one member of the terrible trio tries to bribe Batman which is especially ironic because, of course, he doesn't know that under the mask, he's talking to the billionaire Bruce Wayne. When bribery inevitably fails, he shouts that, hey, arresting me won't make a difference anyway. 
because he's got every judge in his pocket and he'll get the best justice that money can buy. When I heard this, I thought this was an absolutely wild thing for a character in a kid's cartoon to say. I mean, this is a Batman episode where a character full stop says that the courts can be bought and that if you have enough money, you can manipulate the justice system to make the law go in your favor. Whereas if you don't have that money, you might not receive equal justice. But unfortunately, this potentially powerful indictment of the justice system gets undercut at least a little when the last moment of the episode is seeing this rich kid get locked up in a scary cell with this large and potentially very violent criminal. It's like the writers wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to criticize how imbalanced the justice system is, while at the same time reassuring the audience that the bad guy still got what was coming to him. But again, in the real world, are we as confident that the rich pay for their crimes just like the rest of us? Or does this episode pull the punch? Because deep down, maybe it would have been more telling if the terrible trio never saw the other side of those bars. While individual people toil in the streets of Gotham City, ultimately at the mercy of a privileged class of mostly men, the world of Batman the Animated Series is broken fundamentally on an even bigger scale. These problems are global and enduring. And one person who sees all of this is the undying Raish al Ghul. One of the last of the rainforests. The world depends upon its oxygen, yet the rich see only profit in its destruction. You who belong to the overclass have much to answer for. Bruce Wayne donates millions of dollars a year to preserve these forests. Which are being depleted at the rate of 120,000 acres a day. Does your money solve this problem? No, it will take more than wealth. It will take power. And you're the one who'll do the forcing? I am qualified, yes. Rachel Ghoul won this argument. Bruce Wayne had no counterpoint. He can go on his one-man crusades against evil in the night, and by day he can donate millions from his fortune to charity, but the problems are systemic and encompassing. Like most superheroes, Batman ultimately serves to protect the status quo. His job is to stop crime, not change any laws. In other words, his aim is to maintain the peace, not disturb the peace in order for revolution to happen. And Bruce Wayne knows how rotten to the core many of these corporate and social elites are. After all, he brushes elbows with them at parties and other social events all the time. But when it comes to overhauling the system, this bat is not the man for the job. By contrast, Raish wants to rule by force for the salvation of a dying world. Even as far back as the late 1800s, Raish had opposed the American empire, going so far as to try to blow up railroads to stop the US's westward expansion. But violence is a means to an end, and he rebukes his accomplice for whipping his helpers. See, he doesn't want to exploit his workforce, which he sees not necessarily as equals, but at the very least, all on the same side. Of course, while the writers use Ra's al Ghul as a mouthpiece for some pretty compelling critiques, a kid's cartoon can't very well endorse an eco-terrorist who wanted to engulf Washington in flames and force the United States government to declare him the master of America. So there's no real answer here. The world is utterly broken. Batman alone can't fix this, and it will get worse if nothing is done. But the show also warns against using violent force to make that change happen while providing no meaningful or viable alternatives. We stop the bad guys of today and let tomorrow worry about itself. And Raish isn't the only villain who takes a firm stand. In the episode Eternal Youth, Poison Ivy lures in the rich with a lavish resort, promising youth and rejuvenation. But in reality, she set a trap so she can tip the scales in favor of the planet against the people who are most actively harming it. You've done enough damage with your money. You wicked evil! Evil, Mrs. Thomas? I don't control a company that leveled a thousand-year-old forest for a strip mine. You and your kind owe Mother Nature a big debt. 
and I'm going to see that you pay it. This dog of a dogwood leveled enough trees to shade a small state. And weep not for this willow. She slaughtered an ancient forest to produce cardboard. Cardboard! Poison Ivy points out that both she and Batman strive to punish evil. But Batman won't go this far. And he only goes after criminals. However, in the grand scheme, a petty thief who robs a jewelry store is doing much less harm to the world than the head of a company that's actively destroying the rainforest while breaking no laws. However, not only will Batman not go after these law-abiding industrialists who are slowly or sometimes rapidly destroying the planet, he also must spring into action any time that anyone tries to bring force against them. So if someone like Poison Ivy or Rachel Ghoul charges in aggressively, he has to stop it and ultimately protect that status quo. To his credit, Bruce Wayne is adamant that Wayne Enterprises cannot be involved in projects that destroy the rainforest. He's angry when something slips by him. But things do sometimes slip by him. Inordinate power is given to these corporations. Corporations that become monoliths. So big that even the people who own these companies struggle to rein them in if they get out of control. And that's in the best case scenario where the person who's at the top actually cares about anything other than the motive of profit. Because not every billionaire or company owner, as shown in the show, is going to have scruples like Bruce Wayne. So at a certain point, it doesn't even matter how good Bruce Wayne is, as far as billionaires go, if the whole system is ultimately unsustainable. As if all of this wasn't enough already, Batman the Animated Series depicts a world where history is written by the victors and it is skewed and twisted in order to suit the agendas of those already in power. Note in the following scene how Selina Kyle, also known as Catwoman, knows the real history of events, but it's not the history that's being celebrated and immortalized. I can't wait to hear what you think of the museum's new conservation hall. I had it built in honor of my grandfather, Stanton Vreeland. He was the first to realize the importance of preserving rare animals. Stanton Vreeland was a playboy sportsman who'd blow away anything that wandered into his gun sight. He had to preserve animals or he'd have nothing left to shoot. In fact, most of these critters are gone thanks to trigger-happy jerks like old grandpa. In this version of the character, Selina Kyle is a social elite who was born into money like how Bruce Wayne was. And she, too, uses her nighttime alter ego to express a true inner self. But suffice to say that Catwoman's approach to playing Robin Hood comes with uh, fewer rules. Now you know how it feels to look the Grim Reaper in the eye, Daggett. The same way I felt when you pumped me full of your virus. No! If you let him fall, you're no better than he is. I'll grow up. So much has already been written about whether or not Batman should use lethal force. Finally ending the Joker once and for all would no doubt do a lot of good, but would he even still be Batman if he actually took a life? Regardless of how other material handles the character, Batman the Animated Series and its writers make very clear that this version of Batman does not use lethal force or even excessive force. This is especially emphasized in the episode Lock Up. Lyle Bolton is the chief of security at Arkham Asylum. He is a ruthless authority figure who is brought in for questioning over his controversial methods. Bolton chains inmates down at night, electrifies their door, and learns their weaknesses so that he can psychologically torture them. Bolton is depicted as something of a bad egg, an exceptional case of a security officer stepping out of line. But even in the cartoon, there's reason to believe that a position at Arkham is actually perfectly suited to draw in people like Bolton. And it's even more the case when you broaden the scope to all other Batman media. The number of Arkham therapists who go mad and get committed to their own asylum may seem ridiculously high, and its guards may strike you as unrealistically callous, cruel, or downright dumb. But honestly, who else would work there? In the episode Trial, we get some crucial context for how Arkham functions in the animated series. When Poison Ivy is being sentenced, the judge says that because Batman was responsible for the arrest, the court had no choice but to return her to Arkham Asylum for rehabilitation. While Arkham has the stated goal of rehabilitating criminals, 
the name can be a bit misleading. What I mean by that is that the thieves and murderers being sent there usually aren't criminally insane. To paraphrase Dr. Langley's book, Batman and Psychology, in real life, most of Batman's rogues gallery would be seen as outlandish and dangerous, but still legally sane. Like how in the real world, you have killers like Jeffrey Dahmer who ate people and still stood trial for his crimes. Because in order to be acquitted on the grounds of insanity, a defendant needs to be judged as unable to understand the nature of their actions or unable to understand that what they were doing was wrong. And most of Batman's villains know what they are doing. So Arkham isn't only for the criminally insane. Rather, the reason these criminals are being sent to Arkham is because of a legal loophole. Batman's vigilantism isn't sanctioned by the city's laws or by the police force. So, whenever he's responsible for arrests, they can't send the criminal to jail or to prison, but they can send them to Arkham. This means that Arkham ends up being crowded with highly dangerous people who can easily escape and often do. Which brings us back to Bolton. Arkham was a revolving door for every maniac in Gotham. I kept them in. Me! They're only symptoms! You're the cause! The gutless police, mindless bureaucrats, and coddling doctors! This city is an open wound begging to be stitched. See, Bolton recognizes that these problems are systemic, and he's determined that what's being done right now is not enough, because he sees a police force that isn't able to actually catch these madmen. And while Batman can swoop in and get the job done, when these criminals are inevitably sent to Arkham Asylum, Bolton would say that they practically run the place and they learn nothing from their time there. But Bolton's ire extends past the police force and criminal justice. He also embodies this deeply angry reactionary sentiment against the media and against democracy. She's gorgeous, she's deadly, and she's back in town. Once again, Look at the way these monsters are turned into heroes. It all starts with the permissive liberal media. I very well could draw some parallels between Bolton's villainous persona of lockup and certain other real-world political figures or political movements existing to this day. But I think a lot of it writes itself and I won't deny that on a certain level, I already feel like I'm walking on eggshells just by pointing out what this cartoon was already saying and doing in the 90s. What's vital here is that the writers take a stand against lockup and pivot Batman as staunchly against this type of authoritarian rule by punishment and fear. Not only does Batman reject lockup's offer to join him, but he also brings Bolton himself to justice because while Batman is the fearsome Dark Knight, he also believes in hope and in redemption. It's possible that deep down, there's a part of Bruce Wayne that agrees with Ra's al Ghul and Poison Ivy's diagnosis of the world, even if he disagrees with their violent methods. But there's no doubt that he disagrees with the new order that Bolton would want to enforce should he win in the end. Just because Bolton would change the world, doesn't mean that any change is better than what we already have. Bolton would make things worse. Alongside the ethical problems with Lockup's vision of the future, Bolton's emphasis on fear tactics also likely wouldn't work. As Dr. Langley explains in his book, fear is not an effective crime deterrent. Fear and punishment may work fast as a preventative tactic, but the results typically don't last. The frightened and punished criminal hasn't learned anything and it might even increase the thrill that the person experiences the next time they get away with a crime. The trial episode I brought up earlier also centers around a question that's at the core of the series. Is Batman responsible for any of these villains? Is he making anything worse by being there? At the start of the episode, the new DA definitely thinks so. Not only does Batman create these so-called super criminals, he takes it upon himself to be their judge and jury with no regard for the legal system. Sounds like you want to put Batman on trial. 
Believe me, I'd like nothing better. It's the opinion of Harvey Two-Face that Batman made them all freaks. But when Batman actually stands trial, with the new DA as his defense, the Joker as the judge, and the rogues gallery as the jury, the writers make it abundantly clear where they stand. You brainwashed and kidnapped a woman who rejected you. Batman forced me to do it. He was going to take her away from me. I had no choice. You could have respected her wishes and left her alone. I'd have killed her first! It quickly dawns on the DA that the villains are pinning the blame on Batman for their own vices. While in some cases, Batman affected the trajectory of their lives, she comes to the conclusion that if there wasn't Batman, maybe their gimmicks or style would have changed a bit, but most, if not all of them, still would have ended up the same way with or without Batman. The truth is that they created him by creating the conditions that necessitated someone like Batman existing. But I can't help but feel like there's something suspicious about this episode. And that suspicious something is who is and who isn't on the stand and how the narratives are framed. If, for example, Victor Freeze had testified, he surely would not have had any good reason to blame Batman, but he would have had excellent reason to blame Ferris Boyle. Edward Nigma and Matt Hagen could also establish cases against a greater evil than themselves. And you know those aren't the only examples. Surprisingly, Poison Ivy does testify, but the writing, frustratingly, warps her motives to make the episode easier. She doesn't justify her actions as a means of defending the planet against corporate greed. Instead, the real reason for Poison Ivy's crimes is suddenly depicted as her obsession with plants. It's not that she has rational motives for her crimes. No, she just likes plants more than people. And if you pick off petals in front of her, it'll drive her mad with anger and she'll leap out at you from the witness stand. If this was the Ivy from Eternal Youth or Rachel Ghoul from his prior appearances, even if Batman was still found not guilty, you know the conclusions would have been more profound than what we got. But it's worth noting that when this idea of blaming Batman comes up a second time in a later episode, this time it's in Batgirl's hallucinatory dream. And again, the writing focuses on the greed of the villains more than the greed of those actually at the top of the status quo. We demand justice. We demand satisfaction. We demand money. Yeah. At the heart of Batman's conception of justice is the belief that people can change. Because if they can't change, then Bolton had the right idea to just lock them all up and throw away the key. However, we already have enough proof within the scope of the series that Arkham Asylum's rehabilitation program can work. Arnold Wesker, AKA the ventriloquist, was at the mercy of his overpowering other personality, Scarface, who manifested through a wooden puppet. Later in the series, in the episode Double Talk, Wesker completes his rehabilitation after a healthy six months free from Scarface, but he's still plagued by nightmares where he's on the run from this other side, a life of crime and the fear of further punishment. Wesker is released from Arkham and placed in a jobs program at Wayne Enterprises. He is given a second chance. And although he faced temptation, he was able to overcome Scarface and free himself permanently. As for the other villains, when Dr. Langley asked 10 psychological professionals to evaluate whether different therapy types could possibly make the Joker better, the consensus was no, but they agreed that some therapy types likely could help Harley Quinn. She has healthy relationships that reinforce her strengths and her positive traits, like her relationship with Poison Ivy. And throughout other comics and movies and series, Harley Quinn is able to leave the clown behind, realize with anger how he hurt her and feel more confident in herself. She's able to accept responsibility for her actions, realize her own agency, and make better choices. And she's also able to learn what red flags are and how to watch out for them in other people. 
Although Harley Quinn remains a villain by the end of the animated series, the cartoon already hints at the possibility for growth in the episode Harley's Holiday. She completes her program at Arkham just like Wesker had, but she has trouble adjusting to normal life. She's so anxious that she'll commit a crime or be sent back that her panicking escalates situations. Give her more tools and a bit more time, and maybe her next adjustment might go smoother. Harley still has a lot of unhealthy behaviors to unlearn and replace with new healthy behaviors. But if she can be happy living a domestic life with Poison Ivy, she can acclimate to a healthier environment that's full of reciprocity and happiness. Yes, in implicit in her be gay, do crime lifestyle is crime, but with both of them, I get the sense that crimes are a mean to an end and not something that they have a compulsion for. Poison Ivy's supposed rehabilitation in House and Garden may have been a ruse, but like with Harley, she really does want love and companionship as much as anyone else. For what it's worth, I believed her. When she told me for the first time in her life, she was happy. So what does any of this have to do with social classes and economics and power structures? Well, so far, Batman the Animated Series presents us with a deeply flawed world, rife with greed and the abuses of power. The show rejects drastic revolution against the status quo, but if we rule that out, how does anything get better? I think the answer that would be given by Batman, both the character and this show, is that systemic change has to start on the individual level, with changes of heart exactly like what happened with Albert Stromwell. And for most of the rogues gallery, they commit crimes because of an emptiness in their hearts, which often boils down to a yearning for acceptance and love. When they feel rejected, trapped, or denied companionship, that's when they reach for power with greater violence. Birds of a Feather makes for a great case study. Most of Gotham might view the Penguin as nothing more than a thief, but Oswald Cobblepot envisions himself as a member of the elite. And while he's known for crime, he'll give it up if it means he can finally reclaim his perch in high society. Because what he's really after is status. Because status means belonging. And Oswald desperately, so desperately, wants to feel like he belongs. This inner need is what the social elites Veronica Vreeland and Pierce Chapman exploit. They bemoan that there's no interesting celebrities to invite to one of their high-end parties, and that's where the idea enters to invite Cobblepot. Because, after all, they'd all get a good laugh at that oddball's expense. Breland goes out with Cobblepot, but he clearly doesn't blend in, and others start to leave the restaurant. When Vreeland and Cobblepot step outside, they're quickly surrounded by the same types of common criminals that the Penguin might have employed in one of his heists. But he perceives a huge difference between himself and them. That's right, you vulgar vigilante. In my day, I associated with a much higher class of riffraff. I'm so sorry, Ozzy. As long as you weren't bruised, my peach. Now, some of this is just Cobblepot justifying his sense of superiority, and his ego trying desperately to rationalize his true place among the elite. However, there really is more to him than just doing crime. At the opera, he is genuinely moved to tears by the emotion on display, and he feels all the tragedy on a human level. He's not pretending to fit in with the hoity-toity rich. He feels some of this high-end art more than most of the elites probably do. Even Bruce Wayne has to admit that he might have truly reformed. To which Cobblepot responds that anything's possible when love is involved. He truly feels that he has a place now where he belongs, so he can drop the act. Cobblepot doesn't want to hurt people. He just wants to be taken seriously. And if he can get that without becoming a crime lord, all the better. But then there's that twist of the knife. He overhears that snob Pierce Chapman mocking him, 
Chapman says that they'd never invite someone like Cobblepot to a party like this, not because of his criminal record, but because of how ridiculous he looks. He clearly doesn't belong here. Now that the rug has been pulled out from under him, Cobblepot flips backward into his old ways. Cobblepot, once again, needs the mask of the penguin. Sack up! All I wanted from you, dearie, was a little friendship. That would have cost you nothing. But now you'll pay. I suppose it's true what they say. Society is to blame. High society. For a less famous case, let's take the villain with the cloaking device from See No Evil. Lloyd Ventrix steals jewelry as the invisible mojo because he wants to win back his daughter. His wife, Helen, had issued a restraining order against him, and he feels that if he can establish himself as a provider, maybe his daughter can see him again. But when he tells her that he isn't a bum anymore, that he has money now, she's more concerned about where he got the money from. And when he's shut out again, he becomes more desperate and more aggressive. Another man who felt invisible and discarded, and thus turned to crime, is Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter. As explained in an interview with series writer, editor, and producer, Paul Dini, I think the villains are really consumed with personal pain, and that pain sort of stimulates a sense of the theatrical and the wicked in them. I was looking at how people would take sadness, sorrow, bitterness, or anger in their life, and how those would manifest themselves if you were going to become some exotic super criminal. You look at somebody like the Mad Hatter, who basically is an ugly guy who lives in this dream world and who fantasizes about a pretty co-worker. I based the Mad Hatter's first episode, Mad as a Hatter, on a really tragic story that happened in Silicon Valley about five years ago, about this guy who was a brilliant but shy designer and had a fixation on a woman, and he shot everybody in the office. With the Hatter, I made someone who was technologically brilliant but who lives in this dream world and was probably ridiculed as a kid. Somebody used to call him names because he looked geeky and looked like the Mad Hatter. There's an element of sorrow to that character, unrequited love taken to the nth degree. That's sort of how I feel about Harley too. She wound up letting her guard down and the Joker was able to manipulate her the way an abusive parent would manipulate a child. By withholding love, you can get a person to do whatever you want for them. Tetch is a lonely man who felt it was his turn at love and happiness. He becomes infatuated with his coworker Alice, and he tries to win her affections by dressing sharp and masquerading as a man about town. But when Alice chooses to marry someone else, not only is Tetch shocked and disappointed, he's also outraged at what he perceives as an injustice. It was his turn, after all. He says he'd waited his whole lonely life for her, as though he were entitled to her. So clearly for some villains, the answer is not simply give the bad guy more love because someone like Jervis Tetch has such a toxic and possessive idea of love that he would first need to be challenged on those beliefs and helped to realign them. But there's few villains in the show whose motivations don't stem from a fundamental feeling of alienation. And given the right opportunities and the right kind of help, they could be taught healthier ways to get what they really want without hurting other people. One of the only exceptions is Croc. When he is presented with a potential community and a potential found family, Croc rejects the idea of living among others whose society is also deemed freaks. Instead, Croc chooses to pursue his life of crime. He gets another chance in Love is a Croc with Mary Dahl, who sees in him someone like herself, someone society has judged and misunderstood. But unlike Mary Dahl, Croc doesn't actually want companionship and love. He completely believes that violence is in his blood, and at this point, he doesn't even want to belong. Croc is proof that even if Arkham Asylum operated at its best and Gotham provided more resources for rehabilitating criminals, some people when presented with all the alternatives in the world, still might choose wrong. Croc didn't want to be saved.
When the Joker receives a huge sum of money from a now deceased rival, he upscales from his crummy low ceiling apartment and buys a mansion and starts playing golf at the same court as Bruce Wayne. You might have noticed throughout this video that I've said relatively little about the Joker. And that's because I'm not sure what all to say. He doesn't have rational, easy to understand motives. He isn't even driven by profits. He's driven by his own twisted sense of fun. He'll gladly take heaps and heaps of money, but he burns through it immediately because all he knows is having fun and living in the moment. But there's two aspects of the episode Joker's Millions that really stand out to me. First is that with all that money, the Joker is able to wipe his criminal record clean. He hires an expensive defense team and buys out the psychological examiner, who drives away in a shiny new red sports car. All it took to make the most dangerous man in Gotham City an innocent in the eyes of the law was a large sum of cash and a few weeks of litigation. If anything shows the power of money in this city, it should be that. The second aspect has to do with Cobblepot, who now owns the Iceberg Lounge nightclub. This elaborate venue marks a transition for Cobblepot, who ostensibly is now working within the law as a legitimate businessman. But since it's already been shown that he doesn't fit in with the social elites of Gotham, his company of choice remains the criminal elite and supervillains like the Joker. Is this a happy ending for the Penguin? On one hand, he seems to have genuinely quit crime. But on the other hand, or Flipper if you're Tim Burton, he's still keeping company with a deplorable crowd. And I hesitate to say that he's on the path to becoming a good person. It's hard to draw a lot of conclusions from Batman the Animated Series. While there are so many great standalone episodes and exciting two-parters, the writers didn't prioritize ongoing series arcs or satisfying character arcs. And while a lot of the problems with the world are pointed out, their solutions are often left for the audience to determine. The closest I can come up with is that Batman, or more accurately Bruce Wayne, optimistically believes that creating new jobs in Gotham City will help provide economic opportunity for people who otherwise might turn to crime in order to survive fix the unemployment problem, and street-level crime will go down. So seems the line of reasoning. But in the meantime, our protagonist spends most of his energy playing Batman. But it's not clear if anything has changed from episode 1 to episode 109. Gotham City is still as dangerous, even when Batman fights alongside Nightwing and Batgirl and a new Robin. Which begs the question, maybe the ultimate question, is what Batman is doing even worth it? The last episode I want to highlight is possibly the most important episode for understanding Batman as a character, and that's the episode I Am the Knight. Batman appears late into a deadly shootout, and in the chaotic showdown, Police Commissioner Gordon is shot down in the line of duty. As he stands at Gordon's bedside at the hospital, Batman is filled with regrets. He regrets not showing up earlier, but he also regrets showing up at all if all his presence was doing was escalating things. Bruce realizes that Gordon is now the same age that his father would have been if he hadn't been shot. But Wayne can't even bring himself to say the word shot. After all he's been through, after all the things he's witnessed, it's still too painful for him. Batman has no regrets if he dies. He's willing to put his own life on the line, but he can't let others pay for his mistakes. So he considers quitting being Batman. Maybe it isn't worth it after all, but when James Gordon wakes up in the hospital, his words remind Bruce Wayne of why he put on the cape and cowl in the first place. Gotta keep fighting, never stop. What I try to live by, maybe if I'd been younger, could have been like you, always wanted be a hero. You are a hero, Jim. Here are some observations about Batman, courtesy of Dr. Langley. Batman suffers from survivor's guilt, but he's been able to channel the trauma and emotional pain toward post-traumatic growth. Instead of numbing those emotions, he learns from them, and he does something meaningful with that pain. 
the image of Bruce Wayne as a carefree playboy is a persona that may represent all that he would have been if he had not grown past it. However, instead, as Batman, he's focused and has honed his self-discipline and self-control. So unlike all these villains who lash out out of their pain and their emptiness, Bruce Wayne as Batman holds back his wants and acts with an attempt to help others with a detached compassion. Instead of asking why injustice happens, he decided to do something about it. He didn't become a cop or a lawyer or an activist because he saw limitations of working within these structures in the forms of corruption, failing systems, and a public that is too frightened or apathetic to take the necessary collective action. And that's the reason for Batman. He knows he can't save everyone, but he can save some people. He knows the weight of a single life, back from when he lost both his parents at a young age. Each person he saves is worth it, and another reminder of why he keeps fighting. Gotham may still be dangerous, but Arnold Wesker got a second chance. As if all the gangsters and drug lords and killers of the kind that took his parents weren't enough, sadists and serial monsters motivated by delights darker than economic need and greed are out there to destroy lives for their own amusement or to satisfy other cravings. Despite all that, Batman is, in his own way, oddly optimistic. He believes in love. He believes in warm, trusting families who deserve better than to suffer at the whims of the dangerous minority. He believes in rehabilitation, offering it to even the Joker. It's a qualified belief, though, as he can be skeptical, and rightly so, when criminals like the Riddler and Penguin profess to turn a new leaf and go straight. He keeps an eye on them while hoping it works out for the better. The mugger who taught him bloodshed adds to Bruce's education about life, without erasing the lessons his optimistic parents already imparted. The episode I Am The Night ends with Batman running into someone. A young man, maybe a teenager. Someone he'd previously apprehended, who at first he thought was up to no good again. But the kid actually thanks him, and says that Batman might have saved his life. He's learned his lesson, and now he has a better start ahead of him. Thanks to Batman. The kid leaves, Batman smiles, and the Dark Knight returns to his watchful, vigilant post, knowing that there's still more work to do.